Okay. Let's get started. We're at, we're at time here, I think. Okay, so welcome to Con 215. Uh, this is a 200 level session, which means that this is uh, some introductory level content and then some advanced level content. So we're not just going to bludgeon you over the head with like really technical stuff at first. We're going to kind of ramp you up, make sure that uh, if you don't know Kubernetes or you missed the announcement this morning or whatnot, uh, you'll be able to keep up. Something I wanted to call out, um, I mean, this is a super exciting day. A lot of really awesome releases this morning. Uh, this morning, during the announcement of EKS, my niece was born at the same time, which is amazing. <laughs> so that's maybe my favorite release of the day. <laughs> EKS is my second. <laughs> um, my name's Brandon Chavez. I'm, I'm the product manager for EKS, um, and I've been at Amazon about five years now. Uh, before I was a product manager, I spent about three and a half years as a solutions architect working in the container ecosystem, um, working on ECS and Docker and all kinds of stuff like that. And before that, I spent uh, a little over a year as an engineer in the trenches, which was a good experience. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and get started. So uh, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what that is. But EKS is a service that helps you run Kubernetes at scale um, on AWS. So something else we need to do is also get you up to speed with the world before EKS and after EKS. So let's kind of work our way there. So first of all, what is Kubernetes? So Kubernetes is something that's been around for a little while now. Um, but over the past 12 months, it's really just kind of taken the world by storm, I think. Um, this is something that's gained a lot of traction amongst AWS customers as well. This is something we hear about on a daily basis, essentially. Uh, help us with Kubernetes. Support Kubernetes better. So let's uh, kind of strip away some of the hype here, because there is a lot of hype around Kubernetes. And let's talk about you know, what is it actually. So it's an open source container management framework. Um, it's a platform to help you run your containers at scale. Um, and it's, it comes equipped with a bunch of features and functionality that helps you build or run microservices. So it helps you build uh, distributed applications in the 12-factor app pattern. Um, so all the stuff that's packaged there really just gives you primitives for building modern applications. Um, if you're not a developer yourself and you know about Kubernetes, chances are you learned about it from a developer, right? Um, this is not software that someone comes to you and sells you most of the time. This is something that your developers pick up because it helps them solve a problem. Um, it has the tools that are needed to help developers solve modern application problems. So what's interesting about Kubernetes? Uh, what can we look at that helps us understand um, the amount of passion around this particular project? So I think, first of all, it's got a really amazing and enthusiastic developer community. Um, there's a number of metrics you can use to measure like, the popularity of any given project on GitHub. Uh, there are a couple of uh, attempts, some websites out there that try to quantify how popular is Kubernetes. I think. Uh, there's a variety of different mechanisms, but it's somewhere between six and number one on GitHub, essentially. So if we look at some concrete numbers here, the repository on GitHub has uh, almost 400,000 comments, almost 30,000 stars, um, almost 60,000 commits, and I think uh, over 1,500 individual contributors. So by any metric, it's extremely, extremely popular. Um, that's really awesome to see. Uh, I think in terms of release or uh, commit velocity as well, it's number one on GitHub today. So. Um, those are some impressive numbers regardless. And then Kubernetes can be run anywhere. So it can be run either on your laptop in the form of Minikube. It can be run on premise. It can be run on the cloud. Um, and many customers that are using it today tell us that's exactly why they're using it. So they can make investments uh, on premise now. So they can take um, legacy applications. They can put them in containers. They can run them in Kubernetes. But at the same time, they can simultaneously make investments in uh, modern applications, right? So they can build native microservices in Kubernetes, run them all in the same place, uh, and run them, I'm getting a little bit of feedback here, and then run them both on-premise and in AWS. And then last but not least, the Kubernetes API is extremely powerful. So this API can be thought of as like a single um, abstraction layer that can help you abstract resources both within AWS uh, and on-premise. So when you're using Kubernetes on AWS, you can take advantage of the uh, underlying platform. So you get all of the scale, uh, the performance, the reliability, the breadth of features that come with AWS uh, via Kubernetes cloud integrations. But you can use that same familiar API on-premise or on your laptop. So that really makes it easy when you're developing. And you can move these things to the cloud when you're ready. 
At the end of the day, though, I think Kubernetes, uh, all the functionality that's packaged here, um, these are the building blocks for cloud-native applications. You know, all of the functionality that's there to support microservices, um, they're there to support cloud-native apps. So what does that mean? We think where you run Kubernetes actually does matter because the quality of the underlying platform, uh, so things like the speed and stability and scalability, the integrations with the platform, all of these things impact how much work you have to do in building an application on Kubernetes. Um, they impact how much you have to build yourself. If there's something nice that's on the shelf or off the shelf with AWS that you want to use, um, you can do that in Kubernetes. You don't have to implement your own load balancer every time. You can just use a native one in AWS. So the end result here is this impacts your users, your customers. This basically determines how happy they are uh, because they notice things like the performance of your application. They notice things like uh, if they receive updates and security patches quickly. Um, they notice if your application is down occasionally. Um, so at the end of the day, you really want to run Kubernetes in a place that can support your workload and support your users. And I think what we see with our customers is that they believe that there's value in running Kubernetes on AWS. The CNCF published a survey earlier this year that said that over 60% of Kubernetes workloads run on AWS today. And this is the impressive thing about this to me is that this is just organic growth. Obviously, we, you know, we're just now announcing this service. This isn't growth that's like, you know, because of us building a service and attracting people yet. Yeah, this is all organic growth. This is customers, individual developers. This is a robust partner ecosystem that's supporting Kubernetes on AWS. Um, so I think this is really amazing, uh, an amazing statistic for us to look at. Um, so what I want to do is kind of transition a little bit to look at what like, the traditional or the typical Kubernetes deployment looks like architecturally on AWS today, so before EKS. So you could run a single AZ Kubernetes cluster, but generally we, we see uh, customers running Kubernetes across three availability zones. Um, that's kind of the natural deployment pattern for Kubernetes. So you run your masters and etcd across three AZs um, to ensure you have a highly available control plane. Each Kubernetes master uh, essentially runs a, a copy of the same components. So if we zoom in a little bit here and look at what's running on the masters, um, there's a few things that are important. So uh, starting from the top left here, there's the API server, which is pretty self-explanatory. This serves all of your API requests. Um, there's also the controller manager, which essentially um, runs various system processes inside of Kubernetes. Um, there's the scheduler, which makes placement decisions. Actually, uh, it takes your workloads and places them uh, onto nodes in the cluster. Um, and these are kind of some of the, the core Kubernetes uh, system components. On the masters, you can also run specific add-ons. So some common add-ons that you see run are things like kubeDNS, which is a, a DNS uh, service that helps you use the native uh, service discovery functionality in Kubernetes, uh, or the Kubernetes dashboard, which is the GUI front end for interacting with the system. So expanding a little bit here, uh, in addition to the masters, you also need to run etcd, which is the core persistence layer for Kubernetes. Um, and this is basically where all the critical data for your cluster lives. Um, if you lose your etcd cluster, you can probably have a bad night. <laughs> um, so one of the decisions you have to make when you're running Kubernetes or deploying it initially is, should I run three individual masters and three individual etcd nodes, or should I co-locate them on the same three instances? Um, this is kind of a trade-off in terms of the operational burden you undertake when, um, for example, you upgrade Kubernetes. You have to make sure you don't lose quorum and etcd. If you have to reboot a box, you can have a little bit of trouble here. Um, so just one of the complexities you have to encounter when standing up Kubernetes. And then finally, you need to run the actual worker nodes. So this is where your applications run. And these are generally deployed in auto-scaling groups um, across multiple availability zones. This is where you kind of have a lot of control over the instance type you use, um, on-demand, reserved instances, whatever instance type makes sense for you. Um, and this is the, uh, the complete snapshot. So this is what a typical Kubernetes architecture looks like today in AWS, not counting for other things like load balancers or AWS integrations, just the bare minimum. So this whole stack, um, is generally a source of worry. <laughs> a lot of the conversations I have are like, yeah, we're worried about this thing falling over in the middle of the night, right? We're having a hard time forecasting our growth, making sure that we can seamlessly upgrade, we can make sure we're running the right nodes continuously, make sure that, you know, this all doesn't come crashing down in the middle of the night. Um, you know, I get real sweaty when I think about these things. <laughs> so a lot of the feedback we've kind of condensed into a couple slides here. Um, and let's look at what the feedback we've received over the past six to 12 months looks like. <laughs> so the first one is, hey, this isn't trivial work, man. Uh, we think we can better spend our cycles on our applications. And that's, 
that's pretty common feedback for AWS, right? It's like, what's something that we don't want to have to spend our time on? This isn't worth us paying our operations people or our developers to do. Let us focus on our applications. So if we had, if we had things our way, you know, we wouldn't have to think about the nuances of the deployment. We wouldn't have to think about configuration, managing etcd or the masters. In essence, it's run Kubernetes for me, right? We also want to choose from top-notch AWS integrations. There are some things that are already supported well in Kubernetes, or AWS things that are supported well in Kubernetes, but not everything, obviously. There are some obvious lacking features. Um, and these might be things that you're already using in other places in your application stack on AWS. So customers said, we want to take advantage of the breadth of the AWS platform. We don't want to have to pick something that's unique to Kubernetes if we're already using it in AWS. So give us native AWS integrations. But <laughs> we also want to continue using whatever open source tooling we're using today, right? So there's so much that's out there in the Kubernetes ecosystem that makes it, is, makes it what it is today. There's so many options, so many awesome open source tools. Don't make us choose between AWS stuff or open source tooling. Give us the freedom to choose between these. Um, basically, we don't want to relearn what we've already learned in our Kubernetes experience on premise or in AWS today. We want this all to carry over to a managed service. So don't take away what makes Kubernetes work for us today. Give us the option. And so here's where I introduced the service. Uh, we listened, this is why we built EKS, right? So we realized how important a service like this is to our customers. We didn't really build this haphazardly, right? This is something we put a lot of thought into. It obviously took us a little while to get here. Um, and I think an excellent way to communicate like how we synthesized all this feedback from our customers and then turned it into a service is by looking at um, some of the core tenants um, that we used when building EKS. So these tenants kind of anchored our decision making for how the service should work. So tenant one is that EKS is a platform for enterprises to run production-grade workloads. Um, we've had some of the largest and most innovative com uh, co companies in the world as our customers giving us feedback on what they need a Kubernetes service to do for them. Um, so all of this feedback uh, is part of the EKS design. So we aim to provide features and management capabilities uh, to allow enterprises to run real workloads at real scale, right? So reliability, visibility, scalability, and ease of management are our priorities. Tenant two is that EKS provides a native and upstream Kubernetes experience. So any modifications or improvements we make on the back end, perhaps, in building our service, these must be transparent to the Kubernetes end user experience. We don't want you to have to think about anything unique to AWS if you don't want to when you're using this service. So this means your existing Kubernetes experience and know-how applies directly to EKS. All of your applications work directly out of the box. And then three, for the customers that use EKS, uh, you are not forced to use any additional AWS services if you don't want to. If you do want to, the integrations should be seamless and eliminate undifferentiated heavy lifting. So really focused on making contributions to projects that allow customers to use AWS components um, as they're meant to be used um, and use them with their applications in Kubernetes seamlessly. Uh, and again, at the same time, you can still choose those off the shelf open source options and run them in conjunction with AWS integrations. And then tenant four, I think this is a really important one. We'll touch on this a little bit more later in the, t in the talk. But the EKS team will actively contribute to the Kubernetes project. So if we flash back for a second, this is the world today. This is your Kubernetes installation. All this is running in your account under your supervision. The masters, etcd, worker nodes, you're running all of these instances at the very least. So to make things a little bit more modern, what this actually looks like with EKS today is that the masters are pulled into uh, <laughs> under our responsibility, so these are all, all now AWS managed. You still run the worker nodes in your account. And what this actually looks like is the complexity of standing up that whole control plane uh, is really simplified. So instead of running the Kubernetes control plane in your account, you connect to this managed Kubernetes endpoint uh, in the AWS cloud. So the endpoint here is a very important concept in EKS, which we'll talk about, um, but it abstracts the complexity of the Kubernetes control plane behind uh, this endpoint. And then your worker nodes check into this endpoint. You can interact with kubectl uh, with this endpoint. Um, and this is kind of like the, the core concept here. So this replaces all of the complexity of uh, running your Kubernetes control plane. So I've talked at you for about 15 minutes now. I want to show you a quick demo. Um, let's see if the conference Wi-Fi is holding up, if my VPN is still connected. 
And let's switch over here. Did I press the right button? Hey. So, super secret. Don't tell anyone I showed you this. <laughs> this is a uh, work in progress EKS cluster, or uh, console. <laughs> I have two EKS clusters here created, um, but I want to walk you through the cluster creation process real quickly. So I'm going to create a cluster, um, and let's do this. Let's name it after my new niece, <laughs> cluster name. Then I need to provide some information. First of all, we need to choose the Kubernetes version. Today we support 1.7. Um, we will support more versions. We'll talk a little bit more about how that scheme is going to work. But essentially when you provision a cluster, you just tell us what minor version you want. You don't have to worry about the patch version. That's awfully specific. So give us the minor version that you want. And then a couple other things here. So VPC ID, which I need to cheat and copy paste because I do not have the dropdown functioning in the console right now. So we'll pass a VPC ID and we will pass a role. What do we need this IAM role for? Actually, what do we need the VPC for? So these two pieces of information are useful because the VPC tells us where the worker node is going to be running in your account, where do we create resources in your account when we need to do that, and then how do we have the permissions to do that? We use the role ARN. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes and you've ever like, created a service of type load balancer, you, know, you can say, hey, I want a load balancer, and if you're running on AWS, uh, Kubernetes will create a load balancer on your behalf, right? But it needs to know where to create it, and we also need permissions to create it on your behalf in your account. So this role ARN, when you create the cluster, we can use this role to assume or we can assume it in your account and then provision resources in your account. So I'll go ahead with the create here. Um, to be completely honest, this takes about six or seven minutes, so we're not going to watch this whole thing happen, but let's dig into an already created cluster and see some important details about that as it spins. There we go. This one is active. So not a ton of information there. The most important thing is the master endpoint. Um, and then we have a cluster ARN that's exposed. We know what Kubernetes version it's running right now. And we see a little status message, so it's currently active. So the next part of this demo, if I can remember my steps that I came up with this morning. <laughs> Let's do a kubectl config view. So if you're unfamiliar with Kubernetes, um, this is the way that you can kind of dump a uh, sanitized version of your config. So no secrets are spilled to the screen here. But I have a couple of, I have a couple of clusters. First, I have my, um, my long-running COPS demo cluster here. Uh, and then I also have, you can see, the endpoint for my EKS cluster. So these are both configured in the same um, the same kube config file. I can switch back and forth between them by using the context. So for the AWS context, it's called AWS. Remember that for a minute. And then also I have my COPS demo here. So what we can do is against, I'm currently using, um, let's see, cool. So I'm currently using my COPS cluster. I'm going to run a quick deployment. We can do something like kubectl git pods. And we can watch these pods come up. I also have my Datadog agent running on there. It's been running for a long time. Pretty awesome visibility in uh, Datadog and Kubernetes. But one thing to notice is that these um, all have uh, 100.IP addresses. Most of them have 100.IP addresses. It's running COPS. The default networking configuration is KubeNet, so it manages this out-of-band subnet. Um, not super interesting, but let's kind of move on and look at what we can do with EKS here. So let's switch. Switch to my EKS cluster here. And we can do a kubectl get nodes real quick. And see that I have a bunch of nodes running in my cluster. So what we can do is we can run the same um, deployment against my EKS cluster. We can do the same thing here and watch this creating. So now that it's running real quickly, Let's, um, actually, I think I can just kubectl describe deployment uh, to do this. Let's see if it's up yet. And what did I want to show you? Um, where is my IP? I'd have to wait for a minute. Let's do this. Describe this pod. Oh, 
OK, cool. Now, so we can see the IP that it has is actually a native VPC IP address. So that's like a regular 10.IP address on the VPC now that it's up and running. Um, so we'll talk about how that's possible also. Um, but what did, I, what did I just show you there? <laughs> um, basically what I did is on a, cr on a cluster created by EKS, all I did was configure it in kubectl, right? I changed my context to point to the new cluster, and I ran the same exact command on both a COPS cluster, so an open source regular Kubernetes cluster, and the one that we managed. So I think that the message there is that this is Kubernetes. There's nothing super special about what's going on here. Um, there is a little bit of hand wavy magic involved here because there's a little bit of setup that's um, kind of part of the preview process here. We take care of deploying the control plane for you, but you still have to bring like a CloudFormation template to deploy the worker nodes and attach them to the cluster. So that's required. Didn't want to show you a CloudFormation template spin up. Um, and then also, our kubectl is modified uh, slightly. And this is to handle the IAM authentication at the Kubernetes API endpoint. All this will be explained, um, and we'll talk about that as we go back to the PowerPoint. So hopefully that makes sense. We'll have time for questions at the end. If there's questions about that, we'll try to address it. Um, HDMI 1, guys? There we go. So what do we have right now? Right now we have a set of APIs that facilitate provisioning and managing a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we only have four right now. So keep in mind, we're super early on. There's more coming. But the idea with EKS here is to provide APIs that give you the ability to provision a cluster, and then we pass you off to Kubernetes. So as much as we can offload to Kubernetes and provide integrations at that layer, um, we're taking that approach for the most part. So let's walk through what APIs we do have here. So cluster creation, these are the CLI commands, of course. Again, similar to what you saw on the console, we need to pass a cluster name, we need to pass the desired master version, uh, and we need to pass the role ARN that we can use to do things in your account. We can also describe that cluster, get additional information about it. It will return metadata about that cluster. We can list clusters, so we can see all the clusters we have available, and then we can delete clusters. So really straightforward. All the other integrations that are available here are all provided through Kubernetes. And then cluster metadata. There is some metadata. If you were, just to, if you were to describe a cluster, what would you actually see? So you'd see cluster name. You'd see when it was created. You'd see the current master version, the desired master version. Those might be different. Um, the master endpoint, the role ARN, and then some status messages to let you know if your cluster is healthy. So let's dive into actual architecture. This is where we get a little bit more technical. Um, so in this managed control plane that we provide, um, what's the configuration, right? So we're managing the masters, managing etcd. These are all abstracted away behind this endpoint. And what we want to do is make you not have to think about this at all. So we want to offer Kubernetes as an AWS managed service. And to us, that means also providing the reliability, the scalability, all the things you'd expect from an AWS service as, uh, you know, with Kubernetes. So a lot of the work we've been doing uh, today is a lot of operational processes, right? Doing things like making sure that etcd is backed up and monitored appropriately. Um, doing things like uh, making sure that we're picking the right security configuration for your masters. Uh, making sure we're deploying this in a way that's in accordance to best practices. Uh, making sure that it's fault tolerant on the back end, making sure that we have all this right monitoring in place for you. Um, there's been a lot of investment in the architecture to make sure what you get right out of the box is ready to go for you. Um, and we'll also be deploying your control plane with instances that make sense for your use case. So prior to EKS, you really had to spend a lot of time like projecting what your Kubernetes usage was going to be. What's my growth going to be? Like, what do I need it to be, look like in 12 months? Um, and if you're familiar with like the Kubernetes sizing guidelines on AWS, like it's actually kind of specific. Like for a cluster uh, of one to five worker nodes, you needed to run M3 mediums on the control plane. Um, if you were going to run a cluster of like over 500 nodes, it's like C4 8xls. And so you had to pick the right instance type for your cluster size. Um, if you got it wrong, you're going to redeploy. You know, if your cluster grew beyond what you thought it was going to be, you're also redeploying. That's like canceled mountain bike plans, right? So it's not the most fun thing to do. So what we want to do is basically monitor the control plane metrics um, and monitor the performance that you're getting and scale it up um, when necessary in a completely transparent manner. So this is one of those advantages of a multi-AZ HA control plane where we can uh, roll out new instance types to your Kubernetes control plane without you noticing, essentially. So there's other obvious benefits to HA, of course, which is like surviving an AZ outage or a network partition or something like that, still having the ability to reach your cluster, make modifications to your applications. 
Um, one of the questions I get most commonly is like, with a managed control plane, how do I see what's going on on the masters? So, um, or on my cluster in general. So there's a couple of different answers to this question. Um, how do I look at metrics? How do I look at logs? Is there a difference between logging the workers and the masters? The answer is yes. Um, but our strategy here is, first of all, to provide API logs. So when you call create, EKS create cluster, for example, this will go into CloudTrail. So just like any other AWS service, all the logs to the AWS API layer will be in CloudTrail available for you. But there's a bunch of other stuff that happens on the masters. So things like you know, the kube API server logs, uh, the kube scheduler logs, the kube controller manager logs, you know, all of these things, these will be available in CloudWatch logs. So you can use that as like the place where you aggregate the logs and look at them there, or you can dump them somewhere else. It'll just be a jumping off point for those logs for you to monitor. But then on the worker nodes, you can bring whatever you want. And there's a lot of things. <laughs> a lot of options in Kubernetes, right? So uh, for the nodes, you can use node exporter. For, at the pod level, you can use kube state metrics or C advisor. For your application, you can use the metrics endpoint. Um, you can use like the aggregator of your choice. Prometheus is super common. That's a time series database. Um, it seems like that's what I hear most of the time. Um, you can use various backing databases to store uh, all of this information from your cluster. You can still use things like alert manager, a capacitor for alerting. Um, for the actual visualizer, you can use things like Grafana or Kibana or the Kubernetes dashboard, which um, can expose a lot of these uh, visualization tools. So the idea here is because the worker nodes run in your account, all of this, this whole stack is still available to you. You bring the open source monitoring tool that works for you. Um, and yeah, nothing significantly changes in this case. But that does also bring me to the question of like, what does run on my masters? Um, so you'll be able to sp uh, specify certain add-ons to run on the masters. Today, the add-ons that we support toggling when you create a cluster, kubedns, uh, and the dashboard, right? Um, so that means these are things that you don't have to run in your worker nodes. They don't have to sit there like taking up CPU and memory uh, that could be otherwise be used for your applications. Um, and we'll basically provide support for those things and make sure that they're still running. So at, you know, it's also logical to assume that we could like bundle other things that are helpful for you on AWS, like an ALB ingress controller, um, maybe something like Prometheus, maybe something like a service mesh solution. Um, that's in flux, and we'd love to hear what's important to you. you know, what should we provide on the masters um, in a supported fashion? Um, I also noticed one of the first questions I saw like on the Hacker News thread today was like, how do I add worker nodes to this thing? <laughs> uh, as you noticed with the API overview, there is not a section that includes adding worker nodes. So for now, we don't have anything that reaches into your account and manages the life cycle of the EC2 instances that will check into your nodes. So this is much like ECS today. If you're familiar with ECS, you get that managed control plane, you spin up worker nodes, you provide them some user data, and then they check into your cluster. Um, so what this does mean is you control you know, everything about that instance configuration. So the instance type, the networking configuration, you know, what you bake into the OS. Um, you can use whatever instance type, on-demand, reserved instances, spot instances, now supported in Kubernetes, right? So all that stuff is available for you to configure and use what works for your use case. Um, in the future, we'd like to also provide the ability to manage these worker nodes through the EKS APIs, but for now, we're focused on the control plane, and this is something that will still help you with a little bit here. So in terms of provisioning EKS worker nodes, um, we're gonna give you a number of decomposable and open source assets to um, help out with that. <laughs> so we're building an AMI, obviously, like the ECS optimized AMI, we're gonna build an EKS optimized AMI. We're doing that today. It's based on Amazon Linux, uh, and it packages the kubelet and all the necessary binaries that you need um, to use them with Kubernetes. We're building those AMIs with Packer, so these Packer scripts will be open sourced and released along with our AMIs. So if you don't want to use Amazon Linux for some reason, you can take, for some reason, you can take these Packer scripts, you can sub out the base OS um, and get essentially the same config that we're using for the AMI that we're building. Um, for our AMIs, we're gonna publish those continuously. Anytime there's an update to any of the packages uh, or we want to provide um, new kubelet for new versions of Kubernetes, you know, we'll publish this AMI. You can subscribe to the AMI updates on an SNS topic, just like the uh, ECS optimized AMI today. Um, so you can be kept in the loop for when there's updates available. And then finally, we're providing CloudFormation templates that spin up basically like a boilerplate worker node configuration. So this is like, um, auto scaling group across multiple availability zones. You pass some parameters to the CloudFormation template that populate 
the user data section of the instances, so things like the EKS master uh, URL, um, some other configuration metadata, and then when the CloudFormation template finishes running, uh, all those instances have checked into your account, or to your EKS cluster. So let's talk about the networking configuration. Um, this is why I showed the native VPC IP address in the pod that I scheduled on the EKS cluster. So this has been a huge request from uh, basically everyone running Kubernetes on AWS. Um, you know, typically you had to use a number of options that were out there. They were either um, overlay networks or something like KubeNet, and all of these were basically you know um, overlay, overlay uh, subnets, basically. So they were subnets that were out of the VPC subnet. So that made them kind of difficult to understand how they were behaving, a little bit difficult to debug them. Um, and in some cases, you know, performance wasn't um, the greatest, right? So what we wanted to do is provide uh, native VPC networking to Kubernetes pods. And so if you are following along with ECS, you saw that recently re we released a CNI plugin that provides elastic network interfaces for tasks um, in ECS. This is a different CNI plugin, but the goal was much the same. We wanted to provide you the ability to use just VPC networking inside of Kubernetes the Orchestrator. Um, so some of the goals for this were to provide high throughput and availability, low latency, minimal jitter, um, basically comparable characteristics to EC2 networking. Uh, we also wanted you to be able to do things like use VPC flow logs for troubleshooting, um, use VPC routing policies for traffic engineering, basically make it easy to understand how to get to and from your pods on the VPC. Um, of course, other important things were also to make sure that um, we unblocked you from being able to scale Kubernetes to like the theoretical maximum, so like a 2,000 node cluster generally wasn't possible with some of the previous networking approaches. Um, so this unblocks you there at least, provided you have enough subnet space in uh, your VPC where you're deploying your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and this is open source and on GitHub. So I think I forgot to put a URL <laughs> in my slide, but it's called AWS VPC CNI under the AWS Labs GitHub, I believe. So that is available. We'd love for you to take a look at it, try it out. You don't have to be using EKS to use the CNI plugin. You can use it. Anyone running Kubernetes on AWS can use it. So you can go grab that today. You can deploy um, a cluster with it and start testing it and let us know uh, what breaks. So if I can walk you through how this actually works, let's say that these two instances are Kubernetes nodes in our cluster. Um, as you know, every uh, instance in AWS gets an ENI attached to it. Um, and an ENI can take a number of secondary IP addresses. Um, the number of secondary IP addresses, the number of ENIs you can attach to an instance varies by instance type. Um, so on small instances, it's usually something like two or four ENIs, and each ENI can take like six or eight secondary IP addresses. On the largest instances, like C4, 8XLs, you can attach 15 ENIs, and each ENI can take 40 secondary IP addresses. So this scales pretty well with like the IP density you might need to support typical pod workloads in Kubernetes. So back to the diagram here, we have the CNI plugin scheduled as, scheduled as a daemon set on the nodes in the cluster. Um, and what happens is when Kubernetes starts scheduling pods onto the instances in your cluster, the CNI plugin then says, hey, VPC, can you give me uh, a secondary IP address? So it actually makes an API call to the VPC control plane, and the VPC IPAM says, okay, here you go. Here's some secondary IP addresses. They're now attached to your ENIs. So after that happens, after we get these ENIs attached to the, ins or the secondary IP addresses attached to the instances, the CNI plugin also does the hard work of configuring the network uh, at the operating system level in Linux, so creating the subinterfaces, and then also creating the virtual Ethernet pairs and wiring those into the namespace for the pods uh, on the instances. So the end result here is literally that you get a, a VPC IP address inside the pod and outside the pod, and all of the routing is just native VPC routing, right? So nothing fancy, no manipulation of the route table is required. Um, it's about as straightforward as you can get. So this simplifies a lot of things for you uh, as far as networking goes in Kubernetes, but there is kind of one glaring question, I think, and that's that secondary IP, let me rephrase this, all secondary IP addresses on an elastic network interface share the same security group because the security groups are configured at the network, at the ENI level. Um, so in the case that you want more granular security policies for individual pods in Kubernetes, what do I do when using this CNI plugin? That's the question. <laughs> so we're working with the Tigero folks, the maintainers of uh, Project Calico, to make sure that um, you can use the Kubernetes network policy API with our CNI plugin. So if you're unfamiliar, 
there's an API in Kubernetes called the Kubernetes Network Policy API, and this allows you to configure security rules, essentially, based on individual pods or services inside of Kubernetes. So it's a more granular approach, kind of built for microservices versus security groups. Um, and it allows you to control security at the Kubernetes layer instead of having to think about the underlying AWS layer, so going and manipulating the security groups underneath. Um, so basically, the, if you think about it, the Kubernetes Network Policy API is the interface, the implementation is Calico, um, and this is basically the leading implementation today of the Network Policy API, basically the most common one. It's an open source project. There's about 100 developers on it right now, a little over. Um, and it's open source, it's free, but uh, Tigera does offer um, enterprise support if you want some really fancy stuff there. So what do people generally use Calico for? Um, so stage separation, this is important. You can run all these things in the same cluster, but get uh, network policy segregation using the Kubernetes Network Policy API. Um, you can also get tenant separation. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes namespaces, this gives you API segregation between different groups or teams or stages, but this can also complement namespaces and make sure that they're isolated at the network layer as well. Um, Calico also lets you configure fairly fine-grained firewalls. So in a microservices application, you can have a kind of diverse attack surface, and this helps you reduce that. And then finally, we also see people using it for various compliance um, postures uh, on AWS. So this integration is happening now. This is something that will work with the uh, CNI plugin basically right out of the box. So I am authentication with Kubernetes. This is something I hinted at using kubectl. It's a little bit modified right now. And the reason it's modified, so first of all, I am obviously isn't supported as a built-in authentication mechanism in Kubernetes yet. Um, so we're working with Heptio. If, you're folk, if you are familiar with Heptio, they're a company led by Joe Beta, um, who's one of the founders of Kubernetes. And there's this project that we're collaborating on called the Kubernetes AWS Authenticator. This is a... Um, a code base that we've essentially recompiled into the demo kubectl I used here. It doesn't have to live inside kubectl, um, but for the purposes of, the, of this demo, we did do that. Um, we're working on making sure this code base lives somewhere that makes sense in the future, whether it is kubectl or it's something like the um, client Go underneath. Uh, we want to make sure that this is just seamless uh, in the Kubernetes CLI tooling um, and SDKs in the future. So um, how does this work? So I think the first thing that goes without saying is this is like necessary for us because we're hosting Kubernetes as a service. We obviously must provide authentication on the front end with IAM. That's boilerplate requirements for AWS services. Um, and so what we want to do is provide that functionality but not take away um, like the granular RBAC permissions that exist inside Kubernetes today because customers tell us they really like that. They're already using it perhaps with whatever their uh, ID provider is. They might have LDAP or something like that set up somewhere else. And so what happens here with the, with the uh, authenticator is it helps wrap your AWS identity with any kubectl call. So let's say I make a git pods call. Um, the authenticator will help me look in like the default path for AWS credentials, whether that's my um, environment variables or the AWS config file. Um, it grabs that, wraps it up, passes it with the AWS identity to the Kubernetes API server. On the back end, in EKS, we've implemented uh, AWS authentication to verify if that passed AW, uh, the AWS entity is indeed a valid AWS user, right? So all we're doing is authentication. We're saying yes or no, is this a valid identity in the account that the EKS cluster lives in? At that point, we pass off the actual permissions to RBAC inside of Kubernetes. So RBAC is role-based access control, right? And this is what specifies what actions you can take against the Kubernetes cluster. So when I make that git, pod call, git pods call with kubectl uh, and we verify that I am indeed a valid AWS user, Kubernetes then looks to see if my IAM entity has an entry in the uh, config map, essentially, or in the, um, the mapping in RBAC uh, associated with some Kubernetes permissions. So it's going to say, does user Brandon have the ability to make that git pods call, and then will either allow or deny that action. So what this means is that you get IAM for authentication on the front end, and you get native Kubernetes RBAC for um, authorization inside Kubernetes. Still some pictures going on? <laughs> uh, I get a lot of questions about what versions of Kubernetes does EKS support. You already saw when I was creating a cluster, 1.7 is what we've kind of chosen to standardize on for right now. We kind of had to pick a target, obviously, because you can't change every time a new Kubernetes version comes out. Um, 
But real quick, let's level set on Kubernetes versioning scheme. Let's, like if you have 1.7.4, 1 is the major version, 7 is the minor version, 4 is the patch level, right? And so we'll always make sure you have the latest security patch on your cluster. So we'll give you the choice of the minor version you want to run, so you'll pick 1.7, 1.8, but patch level, you don't really have to worry about that. We'll automatically push those to your cluster. So one of our priorities here is giving you complete control over the version upgrade scheme in Kubernetes. Um, first of all, you'll be able to uh, enable automatic upgrades on your cluster. So this is something you can opt into on a cluster, which means that when a new minor version is available, we'll push it to your cluster, we'll let you know what happened, um, and you'll go from 1.7 to 1.8 when 1.8 is ready for EKS. You could, however, choose to not enable that option, um, and you can stick on a particular minor version, and there's reasons for doing that, right? You might not be ready to take on some of the new API functionality, you might be worried about some breaking changes between minor versions, something like that. Um, and this basically lets you upgrade on your own cadence. So you could do things like keep your 1.7 cluster. When 1.8's ready, deploy a second cluster in parallel with 1.8, deploy your applications to it, test it, make sure it works, essentially perform like a classic blue-green. And then when you're ready to go, you can either just fail over to the 1.8 cluster or you can in-place upgrade your 1.7 cluster because we'll also provide an API for you to trigger an upgrade if a new version is available. So you can call EKS create cluster um, and have that in-place upgrade happen on an existing cluster. So one of the things that our customers told us when they were talking about what they need from a Kubernetes distribution is just basically complete control over how upgrades happen. Um, and so I think with this combination of options, we'll be able to give you um, enough choice to figure out how to upgrade <laughs> basically at your own cadence. The one thing I will say is our intention is to support three major versions, right, or minor versions, rather. So the current and the most previous two. There is a point where previous versions stop being supported. You stop getting patch updates. So at some point, obviously, we'll have to either force you to upgrade, we'll give you some sort of notification, kind of like an EC2 instance uh, retirement notification. If you've ever received one of those, like a scheduled event that says, like, hey, two weeks from now, we have to terminate this instance. We could do something similar like that and say, hey, two weeks from now, you have to upgrade your Kubernetes cluster, or it'll happen automatically. So auto-scaling with EKS. We already mentioned we're going to auto-scale the masters for you. You won't have to think about the performance of those. Um, but as far as auto-scaling goes, with the instances uh, running in your account, you can use all of the existing Kubernetes auto-scaling functionality that exists today. And so if you're unfamiliar, there's basically two levels of auto-scaling in Kubernetes. There is, at the pod level, there's the horizontal pod auto-scaler, which can respond to metrics like CPU utilization, stuff like that, um, and scale up additional pods. There is also um, the cluster auto-scaler, which is a tool that you can run which is like a reactive autoscaler. So when pods fail to schedule due to capacity constraints, it will add a new node to your cluster. So both of these work today in EKS. There are things we need to do to make these better integrated with AWS. For example, you should be able to have your pod scale in response to things like load balancer metrics or maybe like SQS queue depth, something like that. So there's work to be done there, but today you can already bring the existing autoscaling functionality in Kubernetes uh, to Amazon EKS. Private link endpoints, I think, uh, so we've seen recently a whole bunch of new services and existing services get the private link endpoint functionality. So if you're unfamiliar with private link, this is basically, um, this allows services to appear as elastic network interfaces inside of your VPC. So reaching that service no longer requires traversing the public internet. So this is really helpful if you have like security or compliance requirements that don't allow you to just reach out to whatever service. Um, you can reach it inside your VPC. Um, and that gives you basically enhanced security in this case. So with EKS, what will that actually look like? Um, we'll provide you the option to access your EKS cluster over a private link interface, right? So that means if you're running uh, kubectl from inside your VPC, you can hit it v uh, without traversing the internet. And similarly, your workers don't need public internet access to be able to access the master endpoint in EKS. And then a little bit of forward-looking roadmap here. Fargate with EKS. This is something that Andy mentioned this morning. And so if you missed that part, <laughs> Fargate is essentially um, infrastructureless containers, right? So this is a new launch type in ECS. This is something that went GA today, where you can now launch tasks without actually having to provision the underlying EC2 instances. So these, um, if you choose to launch a task, you choose the launch type as Fargate, essentially, um, it just removes the, the idea of managing a cluster entirely. So you manage everything at the container level. You choose the CPU and the memory that you need uh, for your task, and then you pay by the second uh, for those resources that you've provisioned. Um, so 
We also want to bring this to EKS uh, in the near future. The idea here, though, is to uh, make sure that we can preserve all the Kubernetes functionality while still allowing you to run your workloads as you're used to, but without EC2 instances underneath. So a slight change of topic. I think not only are we building this managed service, um, but I think it's really important to say that we're really prioritizing open source and working in the community as part of this project. And we're really excited to do that as well. I think um, as far as building integrations with AWS services, we're really excited to find if there are projects out there that already support some of the AWS services that you want to use with Kubernetes and contribute to those. I think a good example is you know, helping a little bit with like the new network load balancer um, that is now integrated into Kubernetes upstream, right? So um, we'd love to continue doing things like that, reviewing pull requests, um, making bug fixes, and implementing some of that functionality ourselves, but just continuing to take this open source approach where we can um, and basically open source everything that's pertinent um, that we build as part of building EKS. So if there's backend tooling or operational tooling that we build that people could um, benefit from, then we'll be open sourcing that as well. So obviously, uh, you know, the CNI plugin is one of the first things we're doing here. We're collaborating with this, a few of our friends in this space. So folks from Pinterest and Weave and Tagera have helped out. They've provided code reviews. They've given us really helpful feedback. They have CNI core maintainers on their teams um, and really, really invaluable help from some of these people. Um, it's, it's great to just see that uh, folks are so willing to help out in this ecosystem. We're really excited to be a part of it. Um, of course, also, the Heptio folks uh, with the AWS Authenticator, excited to be working with them as well. I did not build a slide thanking them here. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely awesome to be a part of this. So uh, also, at the end of the day, we really want to be chopping wood, carrying water, contributing to code reviews, helping to fix bugs, implementing new features, basically whatever's required from us. Um, so I think an important takeaway here is that because we're prioritizing open source, you can give us feedback about what you'd like to see us help contribute to. Um, we know there's plenty of things out there to start working on, but if there is something that's near and dear to you, a project that you want us to start contributing to, let us know. That's all valid feedback for our team, um, and we really want to ramp up on this um, quite soon. So that's about it for me. Um, what's next? So the beta sign-up starts now. Um, I would say, for if you <laughs> haven't already been talking to us about the beta, a reasonable expectation is think early 2018 to get access. We're going to be rolling this out like a typical Amazon beta where we start small and then we gradually roll it out to everyone who uh, wants to join. The service will be generally available, ready for production workloads in 2018. Uh, if you want to learn more, there are two options. You can come talk to the lovely and knowledgeable folks at the AWS booth, um, or you can go to the aws.amazon.com slash EKS page uh, for additional details. Um, there's a bunch of information included there. That's it for me. Thanks so much.